The Fed has just lowered interest rates by 0.5%, and it seems like everyone on social media is freaking out about it. I have to be honest, I didn't know the Fed lowering interest rates was going to be such a big deal, when I thought everyone was already expecting them to do so. And the market has been rallying for months in anticipation of the Fed lowering interest rates. Now that the Fed has lowered interest rates, everyone is acting like it's a surprise, and that it's going to impact the markets in a major way. I am also seeing some people say that lower interest rates are going to cause stocks to go higher, and others saying that this means we're headed for a stock market crash. So what's going on? Is it time to buy or sell? And what am I doing now that interest rates are officially headed lower? We're going to discuss all of these questions in today's video, while trying to stay logical and focused on the facts as much as possible. So with that being said, let's hop into today's video. Alright, so this is the infamous Fed dot plot, which shows where the Fed is expecting interest rates to go over the next few years. The Fed is now expecting interest rates to be at 4% by the end of 2025, and around 3.25% by the end of 2026. Then they are expecting interest rates to be at or below 3% over the long run. So the Fed has officially started lowering interest rates and is expecting them to continue going lower. The reason for this is because inflation has continued to come down, and the last reading was 2.5%. This is back in line with historical inflation levels. So now that inflation has come back down and is continuing to trend downward, the Fed has moved to lowering interest rates. The question is, what happens now? Money will naturally flow out of interest rate dependent assets like bonds and into other higher yielding assets like stocks. In my book, I wrote about the relationship between interest rates and stock valuations, and how when interest rates fall, stock valuations rise. This is because investor dollars are always looking for the highest returns. Therefore, when interest rates fall and the returns on bonds fall with them, more investors will leave bonds and enter back into the stock market. This is just like how when interest rates rise, stock valuations fall, as the return on bonds increase. Essentially, investors are always looking at bonds and stocks, and when bonds have higher yields, more money flows into them. But when bonds have lower yields, more money flows out of them and back into the stock market. This is also why the stock market shot up to new highs on Thursday, because money was clearly leaving bonds to enter back into the stock market. This has, and always will be, the case. For example, in March of 1971, interest rates were at 3.75%, and during this time, the price-to-earnings ratio of the S&P was 19.61. However, by June of 1974, interest rates skyrocketed to 13.6%, and the price-to-earnings ratio of the S&P responded by dropping to 8.95. The peak of the Fed funds rate was in March of 1980 at 20%, and during that time, the S&P price-to-earnings ratio was only at 6.79. And ask yourself, if bonds were offering 20% today, would you sell some of your stocks and lock in a guaranteed 20% return? My answer would be an absolute yes, which means I would be selling almost every stock, if not every stock, to go and buy bonds. And if I would do this, then so would millions of other investors, which would cause a massive amount of selling in the stock market. So there's a constant equilibrium between the yields of bonds and stocks, caused by investors moving money into whichever one is offering higher returns. And this shift is caused by whatever interest rates are doing. Based on this logic, it would suggest that now that interest rates are declining, stock prices should continue to rise. However, I am seeing many mixed signals on what happens next from people all over social media. For example, this person says that the last two times the Fed cut interest rates by 0.5%, the stock market fell and we entered deep recessions. However, another Twitter account is quoting JP Morgan by saying that over the past 40 years, the Fed has cut rate 12 times and every time the stock market was higher one year later with an average gain of 15%. I also found this screenshot of the S&P's performance one year after historical rate cuts and you can see that the data is kind of all over the place. But in only two out of the eight rate cuts since 1984, the S&P 500 was lower. So to say that rate cuts are guaranteed to drop the market is false. But to also say that rate cuts are going to cause the market to rise for sure is false, as there has been periods where stocks fell after the Fed cut interest rates. So what is the truth? Will stocks be higher or lower after interest rate cuts? Well, the truth is that absolutely no one has any idea and no one knows. 
The thing is that social media influencers and investors won't tell you that because they want their followings to believe that they know what they're talking about and want to seem like they are experts that know what is going to happen because this is why people follow them. But the truth is that they don't know what's going to happen, I don't know what's going to happen, and you don't know what is going to happen. Anything anyone says is just a guess and pure speculation. So, with that being said, let me share what my personal speculation is. Now this chart right here from JP Morgan themselves shows us the future returns of the S&P 500 relative to the forward price to earnings ratio. And based on where the S&P 500's current forward price to earnings ratio is, the average one year returns that followed are just above 0%. The average five-year returns that followed are roughly 3%. So when the market has historically been this expensive, its one and five-year returns have been quite low. The S&P price to earnings ratio is at 29.9 today, which is an earnings yield of roughly 13.3%. Additionally, the 10-year government bond is sitting at 3.7% today, which means that the S&P 500 is not offering a higher yield than bonds. As Benjamin Graham wrote in The Intelligent Investor, this suggests that the S&P is no longer offering a margin of safety today, due to stocks offering lower yields than bonds. In other words, investors could actually be getting a higher risk-free return in bonds than stocks. In my book, The Fundamentals of Investing, I also discuss how this has happened four times throughout history. And I also show this chart right here where the S&P 500's earnings yield was below interest rates and bond yields. The arrows point to the four occurrences, which were in 1969, 1973, 1987, and in 1999 to 2000. The following table shows the returns of the S&P 500 over the next one to three years from its peak during these years, as well as the time it took for the market to make a new high. Figure 5.11 shows that it took three years after 1969, seven years after 1973 and 2000, and two years after 1987 for the market to reach new highs. However, we can see that in all of these timeframes, the market produced negative returns over the next two years and had very sharp declines. There was a stock market crash in each of these four years as well. There was a two-year bear market after 1969, the 1973 crash created the second longest bear market since the Great Depression. The infamous so-called Black Monday occurred in 1987 when the stock market plummeted over 20% in just one week. The peak of the dot-com bubble was in the year 2000, which was followed by a three-year decline to the S&P 500. This data suggests that when the earnings yield of the S&P fell below the yields of both bonds and interest rates, stocks consistently had negative returns in the following years. It also suggests that this could be an indicator that stocks are overvalued and due for a correction. There is logic behind this relationship too. When the yields of stocks are lower than bonds and interest rates, it means that investors could be getting higher returns by investing in bonds and or holding cash, and are accepting lower returns for higher risk by investing in stocks instead. Logically, when stock yields are lower than bonds and interest rates, it suggests that cash and bonds are actually the better investment and new money should not be entering the stock market. The fact that investors have done this in the past is just another example that humans are not always logical. However, as Benjamin Graham says, in the short run, the market is a voting machine, but in the long run, it is a weighing machine. Eventually, the market will always outweigh human emotion and return to its fundamentals. How you can apply this to your own investing is to pay attention to the earnings yield of the S&P versus bonds and interest rates. If stock yields are below the other rates, then do your best to stay rational about the price of stocks and what they are offering relative to other investments. If stock yields are well above other rates, then you can capture potential higher yielding opportunities in the stock market. The next chapter will help you find these opportunities by showing you how to analyze and think about individual stock valuations and using real world examples to do so. So to summarize, the S&P 500's price to earnings ratio is very high right now. I believe the S&P 500 is also already pricing in the rate cuts. Bonds are still offering higher returns than stocks, which means the S&P is not selling for a margin of safety. Based on the historical data, it suggests that stocks are expensive and most likely will produce lower returns going forward. So the next question is, what am I doing based on all of this data? The answer is nothing. I am making absolutely zero changes to my portfolio and how I invest. I am also sitting on basically 0% cash and I am fully invested in the stock market. 
Why? Because I don't know for certain what is going to happen, and I don't try to predict where stock prices are going to go. If you have been watching my channel for some time, then you know that I have been saying that the S&P is expensive for over a year now, and it just continues to go up. Just because it's expensive does not mean that it won't keep going up, or that it is going to crash soon. So even though I think the market is expensive today, and that the S&P will probably produce low returns, I keep investing. And this is also largely because I don't own the S&P, or many of the stocks that are in it. The only stocks that I own that are in the S&P are Google and Amazon. Every other stock isn't in the S&P, and therefore, my portfolio performance should not depend on what the market is doing. I own many individual stocks that I think are selling for attractive prices relative to their fundamentals. My stocks are almost all trading for significantly lower prices than the S&P and growing faster as well. This should lead to outperformance and to continued growth in my portfolio regardless of what the market does. Therefore, I don't really care about the S&P, its price, or what I think it will do in the future because I own high quality businesses that I believe are selling for attractive prices and I continue to buy them whenever I have more cash. The macro just simply does not matter to me, because all I'm trying to do is own great businesses that I believe will grow over the long term, regardless of what inflation or interest rates are doing. I don't think there's any point in worrying about this stuff, since it's out of my control. So instead, I focus on what is in my control, which is the businesses that I own, and the prices that I buy them for. I also know that Buffett is sitting on a record amount of cash right now, and people will probably say that he's preparing for a crash, but you have to understand that Buffett is no longer a regular investor. Buffett is working with hundreds of billions of dollars, which means his investable universe is maybe 50 stocks. That's all he can invest a meaningful amount of money into at this point. For me, there's tens of thousands of stocks to choose from. For example, I could put my entire portfolio into a $200 million market cap stock tomorrow, no problem. But for Buffett, if he bought the entire company, it would be only 0.1% of the Berkshire Hathaway portfolio. Then, if this company goes on to 10x, it would make me a 1,000% return, but it would make Buffett a return of only 1%. So smaller cap companies are completely out of the question for Buffett now, as he simply can't deploy meaningful amounts of money into them. But for me, I can easily put my entire portfolio into these stocks and have them be extremely meaningful to my overall returns. So to compare Buffett's cash position with my own makes absolutely no sense, because my investable universe is significantly wider, and therefore, there are significantly more investment opportunities. I also believe that if Warren Buffett had a $1 million portfolio today, then he would be fully invested in stocks, as he would find undervalued opportunities, because they do exist in every stock market condition. I strongly believe that, and I have also found many undervalued stocks even in today's markets. You just have to be willing to look, do the work, and know what to look for. My channel is dedicated to helping you find these undervalued stocks, and my Patreon is where I share all of my smaller cap stocks and analysis. So if you're interested in sticking around, then subscribe to my channel, and if you're interested in getting access to my full portfolio, small cap stocks, and so much more, then consider joining my Patreon as well. But with all that being said, that is going to wrap up the video for today, everyone. And if you did enjoy this video, then please remember to leave a like on it, as it does really help out my channel, and I truly do appreciate it. And with all that being said, thank you all again so much for tuning in, and I really hope to see you all again in my next video.